Thank you very much indeed. And uh, like all of the invited speakers, it's a great privilege to be part of this uh, quite extraordinary meeting. And uh, the quality of the presentations, uh, I think all of you will agree, were privileged uh, up until now to have been present. Uh, it's a bit difficult for me to, uh, uh, to follow on from the, uh, the two speeches we had uh, earlier on this morning. And of course, as a colorectal surgeon, if Professor Markovich hasn't, uh, hasn't uh, prevented it, or Dr. Ray hasn't uh, removed it, uh, then uh, hopefully there'll be something left for us as surgeons to deal with. What I want to talk to you about is an important issue, and that is optimizing uh, the treatment for rectal cancer. And it is applicable not just to rectal cancer, but uh, you can extend it to all major surgery. And one of the most important things that we all know is that if you need a surgical procedure, you need to know who is doing it because it's a technical procedure and it is the quality of the whole process, not just the technical aspects of the surgeon, uh, but the whole process that determines your outcome. And if you get it wrong, then the, uh, the results can be disastrous. So, I want to, this isn't forwarding, can you, there we go, it's, it's working now. So if we're talking about rectal cancer, there are uh, really three people uh, that you need to know something about. First is this man, Ernest Miles, who described in 1908 the abdominal perineal excision. And the results then uh, uh, were, at the time, completely uh, altering of the outcomes that had pre uh, preceded it. He described a radical operation, and the diagram you see there shows uh, exactly his concept that you remove the lymph node basin as well as the tumor in a radical operation, excising the anal canal. Moving forward into the 1940s, Claude Dixon from the Mayo Clinic brought about the concept of doing an anastomosis, what we now call anterior resection. And you can see that even in the 1940s, with uh, a node negative cancer, he was reporting survival at five years of 74% and with node positive disease of nearly 60%. Extraordinary outcomes before chemotherapy, really in an era when antibiotics and anesthesia were only beginning to be uh, coming into the modern era. But I think the person who has had the greatest uh, impact in my lifetime is Bill Heald. He's a surgeon from uh, Basingstoke in the UK, not a center that many of you have heard of, but technically he was a very, very good surgeon. And what he realized was that the rectum is enclosed in a fascia and that there is almost a bloodless plane around this fascia that if you excise the rectum with what's called total mesorectal excision, you can do it in an almost bloodless, nerve-sparing, and oncologically good way. And he was able to show that the local recurrence in his hand was 4 to 5 percent, whereas 50 miles away in Southampton, the local recurrence rate at that time was 20 to 25 percent. Now, healed actually was only describing what many of us had learned in centers of excellence. I had gone to the Mayo Clinic, and I had learned to do it this way. But what he did was different. He described it in a way that could uh, be appreciated by other people. But what is more is that he took this concept, and he went in a very altruistic way and taught other people how to do it. He did this as a time before we had MRI scanners, but you can see now very clearly, and we see it routinely, what he was talking about. You can see the line illustrated by the yellow arrows there of this mesorectal fascia. And this is a rectal cancer, as you can see, just penetrating through the wall, so that would be a T3. We can see nodes, but those nodes are small, so this is a T3 N0 tumor. 
So you can appreciate that if you remove the rectum in this capsule, that you will do an oncologically exact procedure. So he went to the Netherlands where they had been involved with the famous Dutch neoadjuvant radiotherapy trial. And what he showed when he taught them how to do TME, if you didn't give radiotherapy and you compared it with patients in a previous trial, the CRAB trial, before they had learned how to do TME, you could more than have the recurrence rate and you could improve the survival simply by doing an oncologically exact procedure. He went to Sweden where they had done the Stockholm 1 and Stockholm 2 trials. These were the trials of short course neoadjuvant radiotherapy. And simply by introducing exact surgical technique, survival improved. In Norway, Arne Wilde and colleagues brought Heald to Norway, got him to teach the surgeons how to do the operation correctly. And you can see recently published over 20 years, the local recurrence rate for rectal cancer surgery has dropped decade after decade, as you can see here. And with that, there has been an increase in survival, simply by doing the operation correctly. So in terms of organization and rationalization of your services, you need to know the number of cases you're doing, what your mortality is, what your morbidity is. I'm not sure what that says in Arabic there. And then what your local recurrence uh, rate is. And if you know what your outcomes are, then you can benchmark it and compare with others. And you will know whether you are doing what is right. In the UK, uh, they have done this through the National Bowel Cancer Audit. In uh, Australia and New Zealand, they've got the Colorectal Society of Australia and New Zealand audit. And what they're now able to do is they're able to look at individual surgeons or individual units and look at mortality, look at local recurrence rates. These data show the relationship between volume and outcomes. And you can see that in both the UK and in Australia and New Zealand, there are one or two outliers. Now, sometimes this is a true outlier, or sometimes it's just an unfortunate coincidence of, of things that have happened. But what you do is you go and you look, and you see if there are things that need to be changed. In Ireland in 2007, we conducted a national rectal cancer audit. And we saw that there were 58 surgeons in Ireland who were doing between one and five rectal cancer resections per year. There were only 17 surgeons who were doing more than 12 rectal cancer resections per year, one a month. When we looked at the hospitals, there were 26 hospitals that did fewer than 10 cases per year, and there were only 12 that did more than 20 cases per year. And clearly, the uh, 17 surgeons worked in these 12 hospitals. Well, as part of our national cancer uh, program, the government mandated that only eight hospitals were allowed to do rectal cancer surgery. And this was rationalized in 2008. Actually, it was interesting the way they did it. They didn't say you couldn't do them. They just said you wouldn't be insured. So if you had a problem, it was your problem. And it stopped it immediately. I thought that was clever. So we then looked uh, in the next two years at the impact of this. And John Burke, working us, with us, looked at nearly 500 patients who underwent a section of rectal cancer with curative intent in these eight centers. Our abdominal perineal excision rate was about 24%, which is on the high side of what is the benchmark. The median lymph node uh, uh, retrieval was 12, which was reasonable. But our 30-day mortality rate was 1.1%. Now, this was at a time when many other uh, uh, reports were reporting 3 to 5% mortality. And we gave neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy to 54%. That meant we were staging people and putting people to chemoradiotherapy uh, uh, appropriately. But when we compared it with the data that preceded that, we found that our positive resection margin, the circumferential resection margin, 
had dropped from nearly 16% to 4.5%. Our anastomotic leak rate dropped from nearly 11% to 4%. And our use of post-operative radiotherapy, which is a surrogate marker for salvage, that if you have a positive resection margin or a uh, lymph node positive tumor that you haven't given neoadjuvant therapy for, sometimes you give post-operative radiotherapy, and we had uh, considerably reduced uh, this. So the message from this, and it is a message that uh, applies or will apply to the United Arab Emirates as it does in Ireland and anywhere else this has happened, is that rectal cancer is best managed in high volume multidisciplinary centers, that you've got to know what you're doing. Audit and benchmarking are essential to improve outcomes. And what for us was, I suppose, surprising at the time, but why should it be surprising? But improved outcomes can be rapidly apparent. Now, many of you will know that there have been uh, a lot of uh, interest in technical innovation in abdominal surgery, particularly laparoscopic and robotic. There are also minimally invasive techniques, transanal minimally invasive uh, surgery, and transanal TME, you remember I used the term TME, total mesorectal excision. Uh, these are advanced techniques uh, that now that we seem to have got a system for dealing with rectal cancer, the question is, can we do it in a safer, better way that has a patient's gaining the benefits of minimally invasive techniques with smaller incisions, shorter hospital stay. And the balance between laparoscopic and open uh, continues to be discussed. Um, ideally, it would be easier, faster, better, be suitable for all patients, all surgeons, and be cheaper. Well, I can tell you there is nothing uh, in the box of tricks that will do that. And many of us have spent many, many years learning how to do technically difficult open surgery and doing it well. And the transition to laparoscopic has not been easy. Laparoscopic surgery, however, has become much more uh, feasible because of the advances in imaging that we have and the, uh, the optics and the equipment that we have have greatly facilitated it. The uh, issue about uh, laparoscopic surgery for colon cancer has been pretty much resolved because of studies that have shown that uh, it is associated with less morbidity, a shorter hospital stay, and equivalent cancer outcomes. But the concern was with rectal cancer because it's technically more difficult, and you're going to have to dissect more accurately in that mesorectal plane whether or not there was oncological equivalence between laparoscopic uh, resection for rectal cancer and open. And there have been uh, a number of studies published in the last two years that are of relevance to this question. The biggest is the COLOR trial, published in New England Journal uh, 18 months ago. Over 1,000 patients were randomized in a two-to-one uh, fashion. Uh, and nearly 700 underwent laparoscopic uh, resection and just over 300 underwent uh, open resection. Essentially, there is no difference. If you are operated by experienced surgeons, experienced enough to participate in a large multicenter trial, then there is very little difference oncologically between uh, an open and a laparoscopic uh, rectal resection. Korea uh, is particularly to the fore in technically advanced uh, uh, colorectal surgery. And you can see in this uh, randomized study of 340 patients, uh, there was no difference in survival. I've just highlighted to you in yellow there that of 170 patients who were operated laparoscopically, only two required conversion to open surgery, which just shows you how technically adept they are, are, how very good they are at randomizing the people uh, who will be successful, uh, successfully operated, I don't know, but it does point to being a technically extremely good um, uh, study. And then from Australia came the Alicart uh, trial, 
And they looked at it from a slightly different way. They wanted to see whether or not laparoscopic resection was non-inferior to open. And they were doing it not in terms of survival or local occurrence, but they were looking very specifically at the quality of the specimen that was removed. Because if you do an accurate TME resection, you will have that glistening fascia uninterrupted. You will have removed it like you have peeled an orange. But if you have done it badly, you'll have bits of orange and bits of pith and bits of skin uh, remaining. So they asked the question, uh, probably a more fundamental question, can you do this technically as well? And their answer was that they could not show that laparoscopic surgery was non-inferior. Uh, it's a bit like looking at the glass uh, half empty and half full and looking at it uh, the other way around. But they couldn't say that laparoscopic surgery was not as good. So their findings did not provide sufficient evidence for routine use of laparoscopic surgery in treatment of rectal cancer. And that's been quite a divisive study and so the debate remains. So the take home message is two large high quality studies show that laparoscopic surgery is as safe and effective as open surgery in patients with rectal cancer. But this large and very well conducted Australian trial questions the quality of oncological resection using laparoscopy. That has not been translated into poorer clinical outcomes in terms of morbidity or mortality or cancer occurrence. But if you do, if you extrapolate, we would believe that there would be a marginal inferiority. What about the robot? The robot really is one of the uh, most interesting uh, uh, developments in abdominal and urological surgery. Uh, it's certainly, for those who are uh, technical geeks, it's, it's a wonderful thing to use. Um, it has the great advantage of a surgeon that instead of standing for six hours while you're doing an operation, you can sit down at a console uh, for six hours. Um, that is, has considerable benefit, let me tell you. So the advantages are the optics. It gives you a three-dimensional view. Uh, it is a very stable platform. Uh, the technology removes tremor. Um, it gives you great functionality in confined space but it's very expensive and there's a learning curve. There's been a large study, the ROLAR trial, conducted in North America, Europe, and Southeast Asia. Uh, that completed recruitment about 18 months ago. Uh, it hasn't been published yet, but they randomized 470 patients, 40 surgeons, 29 sites, 10 countries. And essentially, they found that the operative time was slightly longer the length of stay was the same, conversion to open was about the same, and the positive circumferential margins were about the same. So the, uh, the, 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 the conclusion is that they're equivalent techniques. There may be subset benefit in the obese male and in the lower third. So the, the, the evidence to support doing robotic low anterior section uh, does not support it from a financial standpoint. So robotic seems equivalent to laparoscopic TME, but the quality may not be quite as good as in the uh, laparoscopic trials, and it's certainly more expensive. So what about coming from below? You can imagine and you can see on your uh, left-hand side um, where you've got a laparoscopic view, and if you're looking down into the pelvis, even if you've got a 30-degree angle uh, telescope, you can see that there is a bend which particularly in the male is much more difficult. Uh, and if you've got an anterior tumor in a male with a narrow pelvis, it's technically demanding. So what about trying to do it from below and doing your resection uh, through a transanal TME? Well, there's now been uh, a number of studies and there's now an international registry which has just published in the Annals of Surgery 720 cases a low conversion rate, 85% of specimens seem complete, and there is a very low rate of all one resection. All one means that you've got microscopically involved resection margins, low postoperative mortality, and the morbidity would be what we would expect 
uh, from erectile uh, cancer operations. A systematic review, much the same data, says it is feasible, reproducible, with a good quality uh, oncological resection. But I have to tell you, this is a technically very difficult operation to learn because you're, as a surgeon, you're doing it from completely the opposite way you are used to doing it. And if we have spent so long refining the techniques of doing it in the uh, anti-grade way, it seems to me problematic that we're now going to spend a lot of time and a lot of learning curve, and there are patients on these learning curves, learning to do it from the other way. But it is something that I guess you're going to come, uh, you're going to, come to hear of. And we're starting the Colored 3 trial, uh, 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 planning over 1,000 patients who are going to be randomized to doing it uh, uh, from the transanal TME versus the laparoscopic TME. And the primary endpoint is a reduction of circumferential margin involvement from 10% to 5%. So what's the take-home message? Transanal TME may provide better access to the lower third of the rectum, but the caveats are that there is a considerable learning curve and there are uh, um, injuries to, for example, the urethra and to the um, internal iliac vessels uh, that, are, um, that occur due to uh, straying off the, 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 um, uh, the very precise resection uh, planes uh, that are more likely to happen uh, doing it transanally than from above. Well, what about organ preservation? Well, local excision is, uh, uh, is suitable for selected patients with T1 rectal cancer. Now, there is a local recurrence rate, but if followed, these patients can be salvaged, and there is no difference in survival if you do that with T1. Now, you may know that neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy is routinely given to patients with more advanced uh, tumors such as T3 and T4 or N1 disease. And Sean Martin, who works with us, uh, looked at, uh, did a systematic review, uh, looking at what happens to these patients uh, if they have actually a complete pathological response. And you can see from the, uh, the plot there that there is a considerable survival advantage if you have a complete uh, pathological response. Now, how do you know you've got a complete pathological response? Well, you take out the tumor and you send it to the lab and they say there's no tumor there. Wouldn't it be much better if you knew that you had a complete pathological response without doing that and so that you might actually be able to conserve the rectum? The problem is how do you know that you've got a complete pathological response? And here are examples of what one might think is a complete pathological response, but there is no certainty about that. This lady, Angelita Habergama from Sao Paulo, Brazil, has uh, really changed the way we think about these things, and she's introduced the concept of watch and wait. If you really do think it is a complete clinical response, maybe it's better to wait and see, can you get a complete, does it behave as a complete pathological response? There are considerable advantages. It's organ sparing, continence, bowel function, sexual function, urinary dysfunction, all problems after uh, radical rectal resection are avoided. There is less morbidity. You don't have a wound. You don't have the risk of an anastomotic leak. And clearly, you avoid the potential for a stoma, even a defunctioning stoma. But there are difficulties. It's difficult to confirm a complete pathological response. It's clinical. That means it's subjective. It's radiological. It's not standardized. And if you do it and you wait and then there is a regrowth of the tumor, salvage surgery may be more problematic and with that there may be greater morbidity. And if you haven't completely uh, eradicated the tumor, are you at risk of locally advanced or disseminated disease because you haven't got source control? So a very strict follow-up regimen is required. Uh, this study from uh, Julio Garcia Cuiar, uh, the Z6201, I think, uh, uh, from the United States, 
showed that neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy might be considered as an organ-preserving alternative in patients with early tumors. And so the paradox here is in this study, they were giving neoadjuvant therapy to T1 and T2 tumors in the belief that these may be more responsive than the more advanced tumors. Here's a study uh, from Birmingham in the UK, Andrew Renahan, looked at over 100 patients who went into this watch and wait program. And what this shows is that of that 108 patients, 38% had regrowth of tumor uh, by three years. Now the corollary of that is that of course 62% uh, didn't. That 38% were identified and salvaged with no uh, risk to their survival. And you can see actually uh, of those who were treated with uh, watch and wait in the blue line that the non-regrowth or disease-free survival uh, was uh, slightly better than those who underwent surgical resection and the overall survival uh, was better. So if you do have what is deemed to be a complete clinical response, even if you have a regrowth of tumor, it is reasonable to watch and wait carefully and it is possible to salvage. This question is now being addressed by this rather fanciful uh, study called Star Trek, which is being organized out of Birmingham uh, with centers in the Netherlands and Denmark. And one of the questions that is going to be answered is, well, if you're not certain, should you do a local excision of the scar and get a macro biopsy, uh, which will give you some more information as to whether or not you've had a complete pathological response. So the take home message, neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy results in a pathological complete response in about 20% of patients with stage two, three disease. And this leads to the potential for organ preservation, but the selection of these patients is problematic. And as yet, we are looking for a reliable predictor of tumor response to neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy. And this is one of the biggest questions in terms of dealing with rectal cancer. We don't yet know which patients are going to benefit from radiotherapy. And it is perhaps going back to what we heard about earlier, the molecular biology, the genetics of colorectal cancer, that we may begin to get these answers. And recently published is the consortia uh, uh, decisions about uh, the genetic phenotypes that colorectal cancer uh, can fall into. And there seems to be um, a, a group that have particular attributes molecularly that have an adverse outcome and those that have a better outcome. The problem is the heterogeneity of all of these. The problem is within the tumor, the heterogeneity. So if you take biopsies from several different parts of the same tumor, you will get different molecular signatures. And maybe we are looking too far down uh, the line in terms of being able to identify because the tumor has actually, uh, um, it, it has had so many different mutations and that there are so many different clones of cells within it. However, the hope is that we will be able to get some molecular signature from a biopsy from the tumor that will identify what is the best pathway uh, in terms of treatment. So what's my take home message for you as a surgeon talking about rectal cancer? Well, quite the most important, if your surgeons are doing rectal cancer, they need to know their outcomes. And as a society, you need to organize your surgery so that it is not a procedure that is done once a month or once every two months in your hospital. This must be a weekly, in fact, several times a week adventure so that everybody knows what they're doing. So organization and rationalization of care. This implies a multidisciplinary team. We are five surgeons, two pathologists, three radiologists, four uh, gastroenterologists, radiation oncologists. We meet every week. There is an emerging personalized treatment for selective adjuvant therapy, non-operative pro protocols, and a move towards organ preservation. Technical innovation is with us. Laparoscopic is, I think, here to stay for rectal cancer surgery. 
it remains to be seen what the role for robotic and transanal TME is. Thank you very much for your attention.